African elephants. These grey giants need a lot of food every day. An atmosphere of apprehension. The elephants are zeroing in on the farmer's maize field. Desperately, the farmers create as much noise as they can to frighten them away. This time it works. But sometimes it goes the other way. These clashes between man and wild animal are getting more and more frequent, with victims on both sides. A solution to the conflict must be found. This is Ali Nkwabi on his way to a recent scene of devastation. A biologist, he's the one who's usually called out when problems with elephants arise here on the edge of the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. The farmer shows Ali what happened. Trampled maize crops, plundered and ravaged. A significant part of the harvest is destroyed, putting the whole family's livelihood in danger. Do something, please. You're the experts. If you can't do it, then they should send soldiers who can protect us with weapons, so the elephants will go away. Ali is expected to help, but does he really have a solution? One that will stop both the elephants from destroying the crops and people from hating the elephants. Despite the country's high income from safari tourism, none of the farmers have received any compensation for the damage caused by elephants. The farmer and his family live right next to the national park and have done for generations. More and more people are moving to the area, settling close to the nature reserve. Many hope to profit somehow from the abundant wildlife and the tourism it attracts. But the reality is quite different. The arid land yields little, and many are lucky just to scrape by. The national park is not fenced. But although the wild animals have access to the settlements, the settlers and their farm animals may not trespass on the nature reserve. Yet livestock does sometimes end up grazing illegally in the protected area. Especially during the increasingly frequent droughts, farm animals are herded to the edge of the game park. Farmers here are self-sufficient and live off raising livestock and growing crops. Often it seems that more resources are devoted to the game in the parks than the children living near them. Conservationists see the raising of livestock near the reserves as being in conflict with their game management. Domestic animals trample the protected vegetation and transmit disease, so they're keen to keep goats and cows out of the conservation area. Many of the local inhabitants were forcibly relocated away from the Serengeti to keep the animal paradise intact. Conservationists are not very popular with them. They see game as nothing more than a white minority hobby and a threat to their existence. Farmers don't benefit from the wild animals. On the contrary, they suffer when the wild animals attack. There are tussles for food, water and land. 
man and elephant increasingly encroach on each other's territory. In this East African animal paradise, there are around 150,000 elephants and stocks are on the increase. The annual growth in numbers is thanks to strict conservation measures. The largest mammals on Earth attract tourists to the region, which earns good money for the government. For visitors from Tanzania and Kenya, the migrating herds of animals are a great attraction especially the wildebeest. The Tanzanian World Cultural Heritage Site draws mostly wealthy visitors. Romantic nature and luxury side by side is an irresistible lure and carries a hefty price tag. Safari tourists are more or less unaware of the tension between local inhabitants and the wild animals. They're more interested in the exotic fauna and friendly service. Visitors believe that they have discovered something here that has largely disappeared elsewhere. Apparently unspoiled nature, where everything lives in harmony. A Garden of Eden. But appearances are deceptive. Elephants can travel hundreds of kilometers a day and leave this animal paradise. It's in their nature to roam, and virtually nothing can stop them. As attractive as it may seem to visitors, Africa isn't a zoo. Elephants need space. They're constantly on the move in search of water and food, ever since climate change started to bring years of extreme drought. Elephants know no borders and wander freely back and forth between Kenya and Tanzania. The peripatetic pachyderms may not be killed by humans because it's forbidden by law, and attempts to chase them away are not always successful either. Animals that are attacked react aggressively. This means calling in armed game wardens. Tanzanian game ranger Boma and his secret A pair of elephant tusks. This valuable ivory cannot be allowed to fall into the hands of poachers who would make a huge profit from it. The tusks are from an aggressive bull elephant that Boma had to shoot because it refused to be driven out of the settlements. The tusker had already killed several people. As required by law, the shooting is reported to the authorities. The ivory remains under lock and key. Tanzania is strictly opposed to trafficking in white gold. Men like Boma are sad when they have to resort to such extreme measures, but he knows that these are not just gentle gray giants. In neighboring Kenya alone, 30 people a year are killed by elephants. One of them was Helen Muwari. She was 60 when an elephant attacked her. The mourning widower is a simple farmer, as was his late wife. She was buried on family ground by her daughters, granddaughters and other relatives, according to African custom. Her final resting place is in the middle of a maize field. Helen used to spend many hours working there before she met her death in the nearby forest. It's a tragedy that could repeat itself at any time because the family lives in close contact with these huge creatures.
A grown elephant eats around 200 kilograms of greenery every day. During the day, the elephants shelter in the shade of the trees, where people go in search of firewood. It's astonishingly easy to overlook these bulky animals lurking in the thickets, and that can be very dangerous. Helen's cousin was with her when the incident with the elephant happened. Like the victim's daughter, she often returns to the place where Helen died. They have no choice. Firewood is the cheapest source of energy. Ruth Mutsetse recalls her cousin's death in precise detail. We were collecting firewood. Suddenly an elephant came out of the bush. We ran away and were separated. I saved my life, but when I went back to look for Helen, I found a shoe here and her hat over there. Finally we discovered her, lying on her back in the forest. That's the story of Helen. Where Helen's family lives, only an electric fence separates them from the elephants. The animals shy away from the electric wires and keep their distance from the village. But where the elephants graze, that is where people have to go to gather firewood. Electric fences are complicated and expensive, and sometimes there's no power to run them. This barrier is only effective in a few places. The parks are too big, and many animals actually live outside the conservation areas anyway. Where the government cannot cope with the conflict, people tend to find their own solutions. Poison-tipped arrows and spears designed to pierce thick pachyderm hides. Traumatized baby elephants lose the most important thing in their life, their mother. They are also victims of this conflict. Protecting the elephants is the job of the Tanzanian Animal Research Institute, situated in the middle of the Serengeti. This is where biologist Alin Kwabi works. Reports from all the regions are sent to the researchers. Ali is trying to find an answer to the conflict between man and beast. He studies reports from other regions, Kenya for instance. In 2005, they initiated a project here. Called Moving Mountains, its aim was to relocate elephants out of potential conflict zones. 250 animals were tracked, herded together, and darted. A risky mission for man and animal. Whole herds had to be darted and moved. When doped, elephants can easily suffocate, collapse, and dehydrate. The elephant herds had proliferated too fast and were plundering the local residents' fields. So a troop of game rangers was called in. It was an enormously elaborate undertaking that needed lots of people and plenty of equipment and a great cost to the government in a country not among the richest in Africa. But it was a signal to the locals. The government was taking action on their behalf, taking the unloved jumbos away. 500 kilometers away, through the villages of the savannah to a largely uninhabited area. 
on dozens of these trucks. Ali is skeptical despite the mission's apparent success. Number 44, number 43, number 41, 42, 45. He doesn't think that all this effort would be practical in his region. Ali is looking for a simple solution using things that farmers have immediate access to. He researches further. At last, he finds something. The elephant's trunk has highly sensitive scent receptors, a hundred times more sensitive than the human nose. Is there anything they hate to smell? A scent that will put them off the second they get wind of it. There is very hot chilies. When it, it do like this one, smearing, just take it straight to their nose cavity. So after that, then they do irritate and they make them run away from the source of uh, this chill. The shiny red members of the capsicum family as a bioweapon. But where to get the chilies from? Ali begins his search. The village markets near the national park have everything Tanzanians need for their everyday requirements. Ali talks to the stallholders, asking if they sell chilies. At last, he finds one that does. A strange sight for Ali. There's not much call for this spice in the East African cuisine. Originally, the chili came from South America. Ali buys up the stallholder's entire stock, but it still won't be enough for a large small holding. There is low demand of chili in this country. Otherwise, maybe if you ask like uh, Indians, people in Arusha, yeah, they need a lot of chilies for, their, for consumption. But for normal uses, of course, there is no market. That's, uh, that is why there is a low requirement of, uh, of chili. People are surprised at the chili buyer. They immediately dub him Mr. Pili Pili or Mr. Hot Pepper. Together with Dennis Wrench from the Frankfurt Zoological Society, Ali plans his next steps. Nature conservationists support his chili project. With their help, Ali buys plenty of chili seeds from neighboring countries in preparation for setting up a plantation here. He wants to put up a fence, a pungently scented chili fence. Prior to this, they had only tried electric fences, like the one around Helen Mawari's family home. This time, Helen's bereaved family didn't meet any elephants in the forest. Traditionally, it's the women who carry out the manual labor in forest and field, which exposes them even more to the risk of something happening. The extended family lives under one roof. Only by working together can they manage to survive. Helen's contribution around the house and in the field is sorely missed. <laughs> Helen's daughter Judy has nothing good to say about elephants. They are bad. They killed our mother. Yes, it was an accident, but it will take time for me to love them once again. And then there are the victims on the other side, the orphaned babies who have to be taken in by Africa's only breeding station on the edge of the Nairobi National Park in Kenya. Fixed routines help them forget. At 6 a.m., it's a walk in the bush. The minders take the place of their animal family. <laughs> the 
they lost their mothers because people wanted to get rid of animals in their vicinity. True to type, these little ones have long memories. They remember their loss. So whenever they come here, uh, they get uh, very much confused, uh, fighting the keepers here. The keepers are uh, uh, behaving as friends, and yet they know that every human is an enemy. So there's that, uh, there's that confusion within their minds, and they get a, a bit longer time uh, to get well with the keepers, to calm down and to accept the keepers uh, as friends and not as enemies. Through play, these baby animals are being prepared for their later life in the wild. In the bush, they get to know nature at first hand. Scents, shapes, sounds, and tastes. Only when they reach two years of age are they allowed to be released back into the wild to join their own kind. Till then, there's a lot for them to learn in elephant school. Back in his 4x4, researcher Ali Nkwabi is on his way to a plantation. A farmer has tried his experiment, planting chilies in space-saving fashion between his rows of maize. Ali is pleased. So is the farmer, because Ali gave him a little money to carry out his field trial. The imported chili seeds have taken. These red fleshy pods contain capsaicin, which, when it touches the mucous membranes inside the mouth or nose, causes a fiery and painful reaction. There is a hundred times more capsaicin in this type of chili pepper than in the peppers grown for human consumption. Ali is confident that he can take the sting out of the man-elephant confrontation with chilies. The last year, we are just uh, interesting more on testing whether the, mo the method is working. So after that, uh, we are now in the implementation phase. We are now trying to, to implement the method of, ch of uh, chili fencing. Ali is going to need a lot of chilies for that. They are harvested and will later be taken to the farmers who need them. The test phase is over here, as it is in the elephant orphanage. The orphanage's dispensary is where the keepers store all the medicines they need for the care of the baby elephants. Over the past 30 years, they've gained plenty of experience. But it took many years for the staff to find the right mix of milk powder, medicine and plant ingredients because baby elephants can't tolerate pure cow's milk. All the animal keepers live close to their charges. Their lives revolve around the young elephants. Several times a day, the orphanage staff prepares the most important food for the animals, milk. The proportions of the fat and protein content change in the mother elephant's body. The keepers try to replicate that as closely as possible. Every meal is tailored to meet the individual needs of the orphans. It's the only way to ensure a high survival rate. A food source at the edge of the Nairobi National Park naturally lures other animals in hope of a free meal, warthogs, but they get nothing. The ritual is repeated several times a day. Thank you. 
The animal keepers know their charges, so every baby gets exactly what is on its own dietary plan. A baby elephant like this gets 20 liters of milk a day from its male Erzat's mother. In the first year, they rely almost completely on the high-fat drink. The two-legged victims of the conflict also have much to learn. When Helen died, there was no longer an older woman in the house, traditionally the one who prepares the food. Their grandmother did most of the cooking. Now, Laura and Melanie have to lend a hand as their mother prepares meals. So there's less time for schoolwork or playing. And the widower helps too. He toils in the family's sugarcane plantation. When the housework is finished, the children practice their English and maths. Their grandfather tries to help wherever he can. The children's grandmother used to help them with their homework. Now the old man has to step in and give them his support. Every morning when the children's mother sees them off to school, she worries about them. They have to walk a long way through the bush on their way to school. Their mother has told the children always to stay together for their own safety. At least the children are separated from the herd of elephants by an electric fence so they arrive at school safely. They're lucky. In other places, there is no protective electrified wire. On the edge of the Serengeti, you have to find different ways of doing things. The actual frontier between man and animal has no electric fence. Ali has brought most of his hot chilies with him. <coughs> the nature conservationist wants to show the farmers how to protect themselves successfully against elephant attacks. The chilies only have a deterrent effect when their aggressive substances are released. <coughs> <laughs> Human noses also react sensitively to this biochemical clubbing of their olfactory senses. <coughs> the men keep having to change shift as the fumes from the chilies start to burn their eyes and noses. The coarsely ground chilies are gathered up for the next stage in the process. The project is being coordinated 50 kilometers away at the local headquarters of the Frankfurt Zoological Society on the outskirts of the Serengeti. Local and international conservationists work together hand in hand here. They're trying to get rid of bad images to help both people and animals. American Dennis Wrench is alarmed. The regional news features increasingly frequent reports about conflicts between farmers and wild animals. Elephants in the maize field. Game rangers called upon to help have darted the animal in order to take it back to the wild. Good. 
The crowd wants to attack the doped Jumbo. The police and game rangers have to protect the defenseless creature. The villagers don't understand why they can't just slaughter the troublemaker. To them, the elephant is only a valuable source of meat. If the conflict comes from elephants eating crops, then maybe if, if people have a diversified livelihood, so they're not relying entirely on these crops, but have some other sources of income that they can rely on as a backup, that can also help. On the periphery of the protected area, population growth is running at 7% a year. Buffer zones between settlements and park are disappearing. The men from the Frankfurt Zoological Society are at pains to create alternative sources of income for the locals. They agree that the wild animals can only be properly protected if the inhabitants help. Dennis and his colleagues want to visit the affected families and find out for themselves what's going on. They drive to a place known as Poacher's Village. There, thanks to conservationists, things seem to be changing somewhat. Aline Kwabi is busy too. He's helping his fellow countrymen to put up the fence he has in mind. A fence that the affected families can easily erect themselves without machinery or electricity. They use old motor oil which they get from the petrol station. Ali wants to stay and help but then he gets called away. It's his colleague, Dennis, who tells him about more damage done near the Bonchugu settlement on the western edge of the Serengeti. The elephants have really gone to town here. An entire maize field, the size of half a football pitch, trampled absolutely flat. All they left behind was dung. The tracks are still fresh. So is the farmer's anger. They just came and wouldn't be frightened away, she says. They are like people, but with no houses. Elephants are really intelligent and they learn quickly. And they aren't worried about our efforts to defend ourselves. We need your help. <laughs> Ali's white flags aren't meant as a sign of surrender. On the contrary, he needs them as rags for his fence. The ground chilies are mixed with the old motor oil. This binds the piercing chili odor for a long time. The wires and rags for the new fence are soaked in the oily mixture. And now they can finish the scent barrier. For European standards, it's not really a very clean solution to the problem, but priorities here are slightly different, and it's the most effective carrier substance for the chili smell available at the moment. <laughs> Ali shows the farmers how it's done, then steps back and lets them get on with it, advising where necessary. After all, they will have to do it themselves in future without his help. Every 10 meters there's a rag hung at elephant eye level, emitting its caustic odor. They will have to find an alternative to the used motor oil, though. As a conservationist, Ali is well aware of this. Or they will create new problems with the underground water. 
but first they have to have a successful elephant repellent. The chili fence runs for miles. And sure enough, from the neighboring reserve with its high wild animal population, there are far fewer unwanted visitors. The elephants give the smelly fence a wide berth. It's an encouraging start, and not the only success for both man and nature conservation. Ali's colleague Dennis heads for a settlement that is regularly targeted by wild animals. The settlers have come to terms with some of them. Monkeys and marabous are a part of their daily life. Almost everyone in the village has a relative who's been caught poaching. But things have changed. Dennis has achieved a lot here. More and more people are making an honest living. One of them who benefits from nature conservation is Chacha. His small cafe is a rendezvous for the villagers who spend a little of their money here. Chacha manages to get by on his takings and he can even afford an employee. His dream has come true, but he wasn't always a cafe owner. He used to use very different equipment. Wire slings were his specialty. Together with the villagers, he would go hunting in the reserve, illegally. Chacha was one of the best poachers. He always brought home something to eat. What else can you do if you want to survive? He still has his weapons. You never know what the future might bring. Hunting for survival is still one of the greatest threats to African wild animals. These elephants have no need to fear any harm from the poachers of Bonchugu village anymore. They can enjoy their cooling off in peace. Not far from the herd, the former poachers celebrate. They're dancing for Dennis. It's thanks to him that they now have modest but secure means. These former poachers file into the village church, not to pray, but for worldly reasons. They own a bank. They call themselves Kokoba. It's a synonym for village microfinance bank. Dennis's nature conservation organization has donated this chest to them. All the bank members, including Chacha, have had financial management training. Unlike many other places in this world, banking here is absolutely transparent. Everyone deposits a regular amount. The community then decides who gets a small credit. And the credit must be to fund a business or activity that is environmentally friendly. Chacha is now able to repay his credit from the profits of his cafe. Elephants have a high value here, on paper. More and more people are following Chacha's example. His next project is a poultry farm, so he won't need to go poaching again. An advantage for both sides. Maybe there won't be so many orphaned baby elephants in future. It's a costly business, 
baby elephants with no mothers have to be cared for around the clock. Even when the little jumbo goes to sleep, tired out from the day's new and interesting adventures, the keepers have to stay nearby. The young animals need to feel secure. They're treated almost like humans. Every night a different keeper sleeps near the orphans, so they don't get too used to one person. Maybe he's already dreaming of being back in the wild. As night falls, the elephants emerge from their hiding places. They start to move closer to the settlements, especially if they have their sights set on a tasty delicacy. After the rains, the plants shoot up, and that lures the elephants even more often to the farmers' fields. The heavy rainfalls have also left their mark on the chili fence. It's definitely not as fresh as it was. It's lost its deterrent effect on the elephants. One after another, the elephants find their way onto the land on the other side of the washed out chili fence. The nocturnal visitors have left definite tracks. Ali's help is going to be needed again. The biologist inspects the damage. He's interested in the reason why these animals ignored the fence. He quickly realizes why the elephants were no longer held back by the barrier. The motor oil has been washed away and the rags are dry so they don't smell of chili anymore. So normally, we advise the farmers to replace after seven to ten days when it is raining. So when they do have a lot of oil, then they can do that. So now we are facing some problem of oil availability. We normally travel a long distance just to collect the oil, and they bring to the farmers, but when it is not available, then they can't replace the oil and the data can allow elephants to go through straight because there is an irritating smell of chili. As soon as they get more oil, the fence will go up again because Ali wants to prevent more people like Helen falling victim to the marauding elephants. Helen's bereaved family goes to church. The preacher has invited them and their neighbors to a memorial service for her. good man and uh, she was a very good neighbor. We want to pray that you bless them, that you glorify yourself with them and we believe we can, we, we can live together with animals. We believe that. We want to pray this believing and trusting in Jesus name. Amen. 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 It's the elephant. Whoa. Daughters and granddaughters are only too happy to believe the preacher. They've heard about the orphaned baby elephants and want to visit them. After the setback with the chili fence, Ali shows the farmers another method that should keep the elephants away. He goes in search of elephant dung. The men take him along to the farmer's little village. <laughs> 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 
Ali mixes the herbivore's dung with ground chili peppers. <laughs> The mixture is then pressed into a form, like a briquette. Using the elephant's own waste against them? Uh, no, this is not our intention, but uh, since it is the mode of feeding, this is the mode of feeding for elephants. He used to eat a lot of grasses, a lot of pieces of trees, whatever. He produced for, for its own, but for us, we discovered that it is something good for us to use to scare elephant. So I think there's no coordination. <laughs> yes. Dried in the sun, the chili dung pack emits its sharp odor better than cow dung briquettes. <laughs> With the wind in the right direction, the acrid smoke wafts straight into the elephant's trunks. A briquette like this can last a whole night. Despite the doubts of some, these smoking briquettes do what they're supposed to. The elephants near the farm have had a trunk full. They're off. News of the successful route spreads quickly. <laughs> Helen's family arrive at the breeding station, curious as to what they will find. Once a day, the baby elephants go on parade for an hour. <laughs> Many children in East Africa don't get a chance to get this close to elephants. Skepticism recedes, but respect remains. And sympathy grows at such close quarters. The keepers capture the visitors' imagination, telling them the baby elephant's sad stories. Elephants aren't monsters that deliberately attack people and their property, explain the animal conservationists. They're just creatures who want to live in peace. Helen's family go home full of their new experiences. They understand more clearly that elephants are not malicious by nature. Outside, at the edge of the reserve, efforts will be made to allow elephants and people to avoid each other peacefully. The farmer is already sowing his own chili seeds, so he always has enough fuel for his biological weapon. But there is still a long way to go before people choose just to chase elephants instead of killing them. I'm trying to encourage them. Please understand that those resources, elephant and the other animals like lions, wild dog, they are part of your resources. So you have to take care of. That is why I'm saying I'm happy for that, because I'm trying to, to inseminate both sides. The importance of our resources and also how can we overcome such a, a wildlife conflict. The number of farmers using Ali's methods has grown. In many places, it has reduced the elephant problem to a minimum. That increases the chances of survival for these big mammals, so that baby elephants can grow up together with their mothers in peace and harmony both inside the reserves and near to human beings.